Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to tune in to Sunday School Bonanza from This Week in Mormons. Join us at thisweekinmormons.com. Send us an email at contact at thisweekinmormons.com. And, of course, uh, commune with us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those good things. And uh, wherever you're listening, thanks for taking the time to do so. We appreciate it as we go through gospel doctrine lessons and talk about these wonderful things and wonderful lessons that, that, that we can use in our lives. And we're in the New Testament this year, if you're a first-time listener. This is Lesson 12, I Am the Bread of Life. We're in John chapters 5 and 6, peppering in a little bit of Matthew 6 and 14 here and there. But before we get to that, I would like to welcome back to the studio once more, Patricia Doxy is here with us. Hello. Or Patty, as we're calling her now. No. Patty. There's Patty. one person that calls me Patty, and it's my husband, and it's on his birthday. Your only. husband gave me permission with a knowing manly wink. <laughs> Guy code. You? Guy code said that I could do this. How dare you? Fair enough. Fine, Patricia. If I must. Um, I'm ex- this is a cool lesson. This is a lesson that kind of just it, we basically talk about some of the different miracles of Christ. Uh, it says to talk about how Christ is the bread of life, which is one of mm-hmm. the things we get into. Uh, like a lot of these lessons, I feel like it's just sort of one of these ones that we have a lot of various vignettes that kind mm-hmm. of that support. Uh, these notions of Christ's divinity and attributes of the Savior in many ways too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's any main salient lesson that you've gotten from it before we get into the actual content or not no i have some cool thoughts on the pools of bethesda so okay. stay tuned for that well, that's actually basically the first one so if you want to go into the pools of bethesda not i mean the attention activity is pointless it says it basically <laughs> talks about bread and rocks guess what christ is compared to the bread and the rock and and unless light. you're the rock monster from the never ending story <laughs> it doesn't you know it's a little bit different but they look like big strong hands don't they <laughs> yeah, very but, strong but I really, uh, the Pools of Bethesda is very cool. So if you've got some mm-hmm. stuff on there, t- take us to the Pools of Bethesda. Yeah, so if you remember, this is when um, that famous picture, so you have Christ and the man that's kind of under the tent. Um, and so there are a couple of different interpretations of the Pools of Bethesda, but they actually didn't think that the Pools of Bethesda actually existed oh. because they didn't have any evidence for a long time um, until the 19th century they, there was this well outside of the Church of St. Anne's, and they were wondering where the water came from. They did a little excavation and found the giant pool. So now they've es- excavated it, and you cool. can kind of look down. Um, built around the 8th century uh, B.C. by the Romans, actually outside of the walls of the city. So at that time, it wasn't a part of Judaic worship at all, mm-hmm. uh, but a part of um, kind of pagan worship. And so it's interesting, um, later on when the walls extended it kind of became this hybrid of jewish and pagan worship but the idea is that you would sit by the pools of the water and cleanse yourself Um, in this judaic tradition it was that the the angel's wings would rest upon the water the first person who is in um would be healed so of course this man with um who was crippled couldn't get into the water so you have christ coming on the sabbath um, healing the man and then um, the leaders getting uh, upset that somebody did work on the Sabbath. Uh, the man did Like always. Like always. Um, even though he did this incredible thing and healed him. Yeah. Um, the man actually didn't know who he was because Christ kind of leaves. And then he comes back later on and says, oh yeah, also don't sin because sinning is even worse than um, than being crippled basically. What I love too is it's not just that he healed him on the Sabbath. It's when he heals him, he says, rise up, take up thy bed and walk. And it's yeah. not just that he healed him. It's also that he, that this man was effectively working in that same sense on the Sabbath by laboring, basically by taking up his bed. And of course the Pharisees are sitting there saying, oh, how dare they? And it, like it says in verse 10, we're in John 5, you know, like the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Then he answered, and I like that, like you were just saying, he doesn't even know who it was at first, right. which is great because they even ask him, they interrogate him basically, you know, who did this? Who, who did, did this? this terrible thing? And I like to think they're hoping to find out it was Jesus because they're mm-hmm. already sort of in, in hot pursuit oftentimes right. of the things Jesus is doing. Uh, but he just says, I don't know. It's like this guy just did it and left. I don't know what happened. And just said, take up my bed and walk. Okay. Right. End of story or not end of story. Yeah, and I think the point here um, that Christ make later on, he says when they get even more upset with him, he says, "You know, I'm doing the I'm doing the work that uh, I've seen my father do," and of yeah. course that makes them really mad because he's putting him on the same level of um, of God. Um, but I think the point here is that work. 
the Sabbath day is a day of rest, but it's more a day of God's work. So we should consider when we're, um, you know, on the Sabbath, we might still be doing work, but it's a different kind. Yeah, it's the Lord's work. It's the Lord's work. And what was that part later on? Because later on, Christ returns and the man like recognizes him. Eventually. Right. He, he kind of gives his identity away and kind of explains who he is. And then the man... Um, tells the pharisees and so then they get upset and i like that the man also kind of picks up on who he is which which speaks to um to how known jesus was in the area at this mm-hmm. time like he realized like oh this is this jesus everyone has been talking yeah. about and i think it's um it's great and i also love the challenge that jesus gives to the pharisees to uh, search the scriptures which mm-hmm. is great just the, the rebukes he has are so incredible because he basically just says like i'm doing what the father wants um you don't have the word abiding in you obviously so search the scriptures for in them you think ye have eternal life and they are that which testify of me right there's so much wrapped up in that where he's saying search the scriptures eternal life is there by the way the scriptures are talking about moi (laughs) oh yeah once again i'm proclaiming my divinity to you and i'm challenging you in many ways and it's it's when you really if you think about it even in a non- faith promoting context how bold christ was yeah. while still being loving but how much he was no bones about it what he was up to and who he was well because this he's telling them read the scriptures the pharisees have kind of made it their like pride and joy that they know the scriptures oh, better course, than yeah. anyone else um so to have this kind of upstart you know guy from a small town doesn't really have any background or traditional judaic um you know, education to come and tell them to read the scriptures made them pretty mad. Yeah. It was a pretty bold statement. And it's like, um, it's like so many things and all where you see the, the learned class should know better in a way. Mm-hmm. And you see how often Christ in many ways, um, I don't want to say exploits their weakness, but shows them time and time again, like you don't know the scriptures, you don't know who I am. And there's all these examples before that with, you know, the many miracles they don't understand. They don't believe speaking in parables, which, which right. the uneducated, the meek, understand but the pharisees are just like what is this guy what's this guy talking about a sower what's this all about you know what does it mean to be born again yeah in the previous lesson and they just don't get it and it's fascinating to me that this ostensibly educated class like cannot process it and i don't know if that how much of that is related to um you know, to the fact that prophecies had to be fulfilled. And so maybe perhaps there was like a spiritual block on them because, of this. you know, that's just me speculating. But uh, I think it's very interesting how much how much they lacked despite everything they presumed to have. Um, and I think one thing that Christ was really having really struggled with during his ministry is trying to get people not just not to just appreciate the miracles that he was doing, but really internalize the teachings that came along with those miracles. And we see in the next chunk um, where Christ feeds the 5,000 people the next day, you know, people are following him into Capernaum and he's think he's like, you guys are coming around, coming around looking to be fed. um, But, really you should be listening to what I'm saying and following my teachings because that's the bread of life. And I wonder how much, a lot of that um, probably factors into the fact that even though they were coming to understand Christ's divinity, when proclaiming as a Messiah, many people still conceived the, you know, Messiah meant a, a political mm-hmm. deliverer of Israel. And I think a lot of that would go into relieving their temporal suffering, mm-hmm. you know, and saying, give us the food, give us our daily bread, because the Jehovah of days of old gave us our daily bread. That's that true. manna fell from the sky. And you can understand them kind of reaching out in that sense as part of their belief. And Christ lovingly, of course, does not just say, well, you know, tough caboodle. This isn't what this is about. Mm-hmm. He has compassion on them, just like I, I think of the Book of Mormon when I think of Christ having right. compassion and staying and blessing the children. But he has compassion on them and feeds them miraculously, of course, with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, barely any any bread or fish and how it never runs out, which is pretty awesome. And one thing that you mentioned before we started recording, Trish, if I can, if I can ape this from you, I guess. But please uh, take it. But I like that you reference it beforehand. Before all this happens, he kind of goes up into the mountain with his disciples, and he's probably weary, and he wants to commune with them and have some quiet time. You know, be basically. alone. Yeah, yeah, be alone. But sometimes our callings don't always give us that solace. And this is a great example when the people they still just kind of come a knocking, even when he wants the solace, and he doesn't shut the door and say, "I need some me time right now." Mm-hmm. He drops what he's doing and serves the people. And that's a great lesson to me and whatever calling I might have throughout my time in the church to not try to table something and right. say, we can get to this later. I need to work on this. <laughs> this but, meeting's gone over in an hour. Let's let's wrap things up. Well, I still do that. <laughs> uh, we had a word council that went 20 minutes over last week and I was like, yeah, Inexcusable. Kids, you got, guys, come on. The, come on. God is also a God of order. Let's talk about <laughs> But uh, that's that's one thing that speaks to me a lot. Don't don't it doesn't matter how weary I am. Sometimes people are going to need stuff, and that's a time to answer the call. Right. Make it happen. 
Yeah. Great. So um, the next part that it moves after feeding feeding the people, and the lesson talks about magnifying callings, which Jeff alluded to. It talks about sure. how Christ tells his disciples that they are going to go over to Capernaum, um, which is a city on the north side of the Sea of yeah, Galilee. Yeah, think about that, yeah. Um, so Christ sends the disciples on the boat. Uh, it starts to be stormy, if you remember, and then they see Christ. Well, they see something kind of floating along the rod- water, yeah. um, are a little bit scared, realize it's Christ, and of course that's when Peter has his um, half of a miraculous moment <laughs> and then kind of fails. And I'll, say, I'll say it's still a miraculous moment. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. there's a great lesson in there. And what's interesting is, of course, only Matthew has the account of Peter. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark and John all have the account of Christ being out on the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it basically just says they bade him enter and he came into the boat with them and calmed the seas. And that was kind of the end of it. But I love the account in Matthew where instead Peter just says, because before Christ says, you know, be not afraid, it is I. And it's to Peter being classic. Peter says, all right, Lord, if it's you, like trying to say, like, prove that it's you to me <laughs> because I am always doubting stuff. And I want some <laughs> proof that this is you and not some other person standing on the water. Um and I love that. And he says, if it is you, then like, tell me to come to you then. Tell me to come out there on the water. And Christ says, do it. And uh, I think those few steps, however long it was that Peter did walk across the water is pretty dang awesome. And we use it all the time in the church as an example of like, you know, f- through pure faith, anything right, is possible. Right. I used to try to actually, kid you not, when I was younger, I wanted to will myself to be able to fly. Okay. And like, I, re- I worked hard to try to like eradicate doubt from my mind because Peter only sank. <laughs> When he started doubting, and I was just like, "If I can, if I can only, believe. if I can believe and like not have doubt, I will fly." And I've never flown still, so I don't know if I lack faith or. But you've the, eradicated all doubt out of your life, which has been amazing. Sort of. <laughs> it's either it's I'm not I don't know if I still have doubts or it's not relevant to my spiritual progression. So God <laughs> hasn't blessed me with the ability of flight. I'm not sure, but um, let's work towards that. But I think it's a really cool example of Peter. I know it's it's one of those sort of very common ones in the church that we always use to talk about faith and and doubt. Because what happens to Peter when he doubts? He, I mean, when I, I think it's interesting. It's not. It doesn't talk about him doubting the Savior. It's yeah. just when he looks around and sees how tumultuous the sea is. He gets scared. That's when he gets scared. I think it's interesting. His faith in the Savior did not waver, but his circumstance yeah. started to freak him out. I think that can happen with us a lot. We Definitely. have. We have faith and we have trust in the Savior, but when we let the circumstance around us freak us out, that's when our um, that's when our trust in Him can f- falter. That's a really good point. I think that's a huge point because, yeah, how much do we let what's around us affect how effectively mm-hmm. we still do everything else? That's a very very good point. Um, and then uh, moving on, um, the day after this miracle with the loaves and the fishes, the people, of course, I think you referenced this earlier. You know, they follow Him to Capernaum mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, simple questions in the lesson, such as like, why did they follow him? Well, I think they were into it, and so they followed him. That's the best way right. to sum it up. Uh, and they were they were looking to be fed, definitely. And like you said before, yeah. And then he tells them, of course, I am the bread of life. Um, what does that mean, though, Patricia? Why, well, why is that like? Why is that relevant to the Jewish audience of the time? Um, well, I don't know what you're fishing for, but I have this Nothing quote. Nothing really. I'm genuinely asking you a question. <laughs> okay. I have this quote by, um, uh, Jeffrey R. Holland. He says, uh, during the Savior's Galilean ministry, he chided those who had heard of him feeding the 5,000 with only five barley loaves and two fishes and now flocked to him expecting a free lunch. That mm. food, important as it was, was incidental to the real nourishment he was trying to give them. Um... So, and he also says, if you partake of this, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst again. Um, so I think he, not I think, but obviously he's bringing them um, the new covenant, the new gospel. And he's hoping that, you know, yes, he's doing these miracles, but that they'll really um, see the blessings that t- can come into their lives with this establishment of the new covenant. Yeah. And they'll come to understand that it's not about just physical nourishment the, right the, the, this bread of life is to to never hunger and never thirst is you know this goes back to referencing even uh prophecies of, of amos for example you know about mm-hmm. wandering to and fro and thirsting and not knowing where to find anything mm-hmm. that we're promised we will we will never thirst we will always have uh christ's truth with us which can carry us over these gaps carry us through periods of spiritual hunger for example mm-hmm. uh, I, I really like those one of the closing quotes from president hunter 
where he says, we must know Christ better than we know him. We must remember him more often than we remember him. We must serve him more valiantly than we serve him. Then we will drink water springing up unto eternal life and we'll eat the bread of life. Mm -hmm. Pretty yeah. strong. And I like, I, I like that it's talking about, you know, how, um, cause you know, even after reading the scriptures, hopefully that hunger for the scripture continues. So when he yeah, says, you totally. know, you'll never hunger, I think that's, that's pointing out that there are a lot of things that can vie for attention, but if we give Christ playing time in our lives, he's going to help fill us with purpose and direction. And that as we keep on getting to know him, like um, President Hunter said, um, we can be satisfied in our lives. Absolutely. Well, everyone, we encourage you to re read uh, once more. John 5 and 6 will mostly cover you, but read Matthew 6 and uh, 14, too, if you want to, to pad that out a little bit. This is a good lesson, solid material here. Once again, it's lesson 12, I am the bread of life from the New Testament Gospel Doctrine Manual. Uh, we hope if you liked this, you'll also look out for Third Hour of Power, where we talk about the Priesthood and Relief Society lessons from the Ezra Taft Benson Manual. Oh, actually, right now. If you're listening to this four years from now, it's some other prophet. But <laughs> whatever, you know, teaching is the presidents of the church. Or for all we know, by then it'll be teachings of women in the church. Who knows? Who knows what'll happen in that time? That would be wonderful. I think chances are in four years, actually, this lesson manual we're using right now won't exist anymore. So well, I don't think it'll anymore. exist by the end of the year. Probably not. So it's been anyway. a good ride, everybody. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for joining us. But Patricia, thank you for taking the time to come in. Yeah, thanks so nice much. Nice to have you. And this is a Sunday School Bonanza. Wishing you a great Sabbath. Make it great. 